I guess we'll pray and get started. Father, we thank you again. We thank you for this moment. Lord, we ask for your help this morning. We ask for your mercy, Lord. We ask for your help, Lord. We ask for ears to hear. We ask, Lord, for eyes to see. We ask, Lord, that our hearts be before you, Lord. And this morning that your word may find us. We ask you to do the supernatural, Lord. That which only you can do, we ask you to do. And Lord, be with us. Lord, that you would transform us even now. Lord, even now. Your hand may be upon us, even now, Lord Jesus. We ask you to get our attention, and not only our attention, Lord, grab a hold of us. Grab a hold of our hearts, Lord. Bring us to yourself. Draw us. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I want to share something that the Lord shared with me. Uh, I hadn't seen it before. Um, I hadn't made the connection of what I'm going to share. And this is in a preliminary way. I am sure, as you, as, as you know, when the Lord begins to give you something, he, um, he begins it as a seed, and then it begins to grow in you. So I was on my lunch break at work, and I was spending that time before the Lord, and, and as I was praying, I, I felt like the Holy Spirit asked me a question. And he said, <laughs> you know how Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. So for whatever reason, that scripture came up in my heart. And I felt like the Holy Spirit asked me, did you know that rest is the Sabbath and the Sabbath is rest? But in the way he presented it to me, I never knew that before. I, I hadn't seen it. And so I want to begin there. In Exodus chapter 20, there's a list of what we refer to as the Ten Commandments. And the first three are toward God. The fourth one is a transition commandment. Because it is toward God, but also relating to men. The fifth begins all that relates to men. In that the fifth one says to honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you, and that you may live long in the land. But my focus will be on that transition commandment, the fourth commandment. And in Exodus 20 verse 8, we read this. Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, this is in Exodus chapter 20. That's the fourth commandment about the Sabbath and how that this Sabbath, God rested in it. And because he rested, he hallowed the day or made it holy. 
He hallowed the day and blessed the day. And now he welcomes humanity to keep the Sabbath and honor him in it. But before it came to Israel as a commandment, God had already initiated this Sabbath uh, um, requirement, as it were. But it wasn't as a requirement yet. But he had already introduced it. Now, I will say this. I will say that God will always build on the truth that he has revealed to you. Let me say that again. I said that God will always build on the truth that he has revealed to you. If God shows you something, he builds on it. He doesn't take it away. He brings it to more and more and more and more fullness. So by the time now he came to Moses... Now understand Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And God himself, by his own finger, wrote on tablets of stone. Those that Moses later crashed because when he came down from the mountain, the people were having an orgy. And so God had to call Mo Moses for a second time back on the mountain, but this time, God told Moses, I will not write on the tablets. You will have to carve them out. But before God brought that truth into a commandment, he had already in Exodus 17, three chapters before the commandment, God had already started to talk to Moses and the people of Israel about the Sabbath. He hadn't made it into a law. He hadn't made it into a commandment. But he had begun to offer that revelation to them. So in Exodus, I mean, excuse me, it's not 17, 17 it is Exodus 16. So you will realize that Exodus 16 is the first time that the scriptures present the Sabbath. Now, first mention, uh, Apostle and Reverend Ann and, and, and all who have taken theology in, in, in college as a course, understand there are some laws of interpreting scripture. And one of them is the law of first mention, right? That when God introduces a subject in the scriptures for the first time, in that context, he's prophesying the fullness of that thing. And that is based on what the, the scriptures say that God calls the end from the beginning. So we can always begin to understand the end of a thing by looking at how God did it in the beginning of the thing. Because he calls the end from the beginning. That's why the Bible would say things like that the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. How was he slain? How was there a lamb slain before even the earth was created? It's because God calls the end from the beginning. So in the beginning, then, we can capture the end of a thing in it. So the first time in the scriptures we encounter the word Sabbath is in Exodus 16. I want us to see the context within which it was presented. So Exodus 16, this is precisely 45 days after God had delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. Okay? Okay. So you remember the ten wonders that God did in, in Egypt? And he brought his people out with a strong and a mighty arm. And he, he made them cross the Red Sea and all these things that he did. This day that we're about to read is precisely 45 days from the day they left Egypt. 
Meaning to say, this is only a month and a half since these people who were previously slaves for 400 years of their generations, only 45 days since they had seen the most spectacular, incredible miracles that God had done. And then we read this from verse 1. It says, they set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, basically 45 days. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel, notice what they did. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And what did they grumble saying? Verse 3. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we have died, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So they grumbled. Now, how did God respond to their grumbling? Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. And look at this and underline it in your mind. That I may test them. Whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So then, so we read that on the sixth day they gathered, this is now verse 22. So we're going to jump from verse 5 of Exodus 16, go all the way down to verse 22. And it says on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two armors each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came, and when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, notice what he said, verse 23, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. And what are you supposed to do on this holy Sabbath? You're supposed to bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over, lay aside to be kept till the morning. Verse 24. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them. And it did not stink. And there were no worms in it. Verse 25. Moses said, eat it today for today. Is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. So I wanted us to see that when God presented the revelation of the Sabbath, remember, we're in Exodus 16, four chapters later. God will give the Sabbath, the law of the Sabbath, as a commandment. But before he upped the ante and made it a commandment, four chapters earlier, he had revealed the Sabbath. In which context? In the context of God's provision. When the people grumbled against the Lord because they grumbled against Moses and Aaron, the response of God was, because of your grumbling. It means that God took offense at their grumbling. Because think about this. Imagine a God, apostle, imagine a God that goes out of his way to do all these incredible miracles, brings out an entire race of people. Race is not a good term, but an, an entire people group. Uh huh. He brings them out with a mighty hand. And imagine this. 
He has no plan about what they're going to eat. Do you think that that was the case? Do you think that God did not have a plan to feed the people in the wilderness? First of all, who took them around and took them in the way of the wilderness? He did that. God did that. And why did he do that? The scriptures say that from where they were to the promised land, it was an 11-day journey. But the Bible tells us that God knew that when the people see war, they will shrink back and they would go back to Egypt. So what does God decide to do in his wisdom? He decides to take them through the wilderness. And how are they led in the wilderness? They were led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This angel of his presence that were, was with the camp of the Israelites, he would be in a manifestation of a cloud. Hey, and at night, his brilliance would seem as if it were a pillar of fire. The angel of the Lord was that to them. And when he would lift and when he would begin to move, then the entire camp of the Israelites would begin to move. So we would say this, God absolutely had a plan for their provision. It did not require for them to grumble. Now, were they hungry? Yes. And why would God let them go hungry before he provided for them? Because he was testing them. And it is in the context of God's provision to us, God's daily provision, God's daily provision, that he gave the revelation of the Sabbath. And he tells them, and let's see it together here. He tells them, I'm going to go back just a touch to verse 4 of Exodus 16. The Lord saying to Moses, he says, And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion. A day's portion. They shall gather every day. That I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. It's within that context of daily provision that he gives them the revelation of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath had nothing to do necessarily with working or not working. And I know I'm jumping ahead of myself and we'll see that. It had everything to do with God testing their hearts. As he is testing my heart, as he is testing your heart. Now, let's continue with our first mention. So then we go all the way from the Old Testament, from Exodus 20, all the way to the New Testament. Let me... Say this again, God always builds on the truth that he has revealed to you. So he gives you a revelation. He draws your curiosity to a certain truth by his Holy Spirit. When he does that, he begins to build on it. And we saw Exodus 16... And then Exodus 20, there's a progression. And we can talk about many things. We can talk about Exodus 31. We can talk about Exodus 35. We can talk about Leviticus and Numbers, where God built on the revelation of the Sabbath. From a revelation in Exodus 16 to a commandment, to the law of the Sabbaths, plural, to the regulations of the Sabbath, to the new moon and the Sabbaths and the festivals, he continued to build it. But let's set our eyes on the first mention of the Sabbath in the New Testament. 
This is Matthew chapter 12. This is before the Lord gave the most comprehensive parable that he ever gave. The parable of the sower in Matthew 13. And the parable of the sower is that parable that he said, if you do not understand that one, how will you understand the rest? So that was in Matthew 13. But before Matthew 13, he was in Matthew 12. This is the first time the Sabbath is mentioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. So from verse 1. He says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples, look at this, were hungry. Do you see that? Do you think it's a coincidence that the Holy Spirit immediately brings the issue of hunger? Whereas in Exodus 16, the issue was hunger. When he revealed the Sabbath, the issue was hunger. In the New Testament, when the Lord Jesus Christ addresses hunger, it begins like this. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. <laughs> when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look. Your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, they're referring to Exodus 16. The Israelites were not supposed to go out and gather manna for food. Verse 3. Now, Jesus replies to them. He asked them this. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? What did David do and those that were with him? Verse 4, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Verse 6, he said, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here, referring to himself. And if you, have, if you had known what this means, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So basically Jesus is saying, my disciples have not sinned. Then verse 8, he brings the revelation that became a commandment, that became the laws on the Sabbath, that became regulations about the Sabbath, these Continuing revelation, he brings it to its fullness by saying this in verse 8 of Matthew 12. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Wow. Here was a man saying, I am God Almighty, essentially. Then Jesus went from there, entered their synagogue. Now I am jumping to verse 9. Well, next verse, verse 9. Verse 10, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, this Sabbath discourse is still happening. And so the Pharisees are like, you know, first of all, your disciples were eating. Then second of all, now... Is it lawful to heal? And what they were doing, they were doing that so that they might accuse him. So verse 11, Jesus says to them, Which one of you has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Verse 12, Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Then he says this, So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and he was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. So the first mention of Sabbath in the New Testament is within the context of God's provision. God's provision for food. The disciples were hungry. They plucked grain. They ate it. They violated the Sabbath in the eyes of the Pharisees. But Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And in that statement, 
He brings to fullness the revelation of the Sabbath. And it wasn't about rest as we know it. Because the issue here was that they considered plucking grain of wheat to eat as work. They interpreted it to mean, according to the law of Moses, you are not supposed to work. And Jesus essentially is saying, it has nothing to do with physical work. It does have to do with work, but not physical work. Not firstly. And then the revelation continues. So after Jesus brings it to its fullness in Matthew chapter 12, one of the foremost apostles that God used in the first century addressed the issue of the Sabbath. This is Apostle Paul. And he goes to Colossians chapter 2, is where we find this. And he begins, and he's the only apostle in the New Testament from the book of Acts, after the ascension, all the way to the book of Revelation, he's the only apostle that the Holy Spirit allowed to address the issue of the Sabbath. And the context in which he's addressing the issue of the Sabbath is in the context of the supremacy and the preeminency of Christ. Mm -hmm. So Colossians, and you go read it sometime. Paul presents truth about Jesus Christ that had never been heard. They had never been taught. They had never been shared. He would say things like, he is the head of all authority, the head of all principality, the head of everything. He says things like, Christ is meant to feel all things. These things that Paul was saying by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the book of Colossians, they had not been written by anybody. They had not been taught by anybody. And it is within that context of the grandeur of the Christ and his administration that he presents the discourse on the Sabbath. The first time it was mentioned, the people were hungry. The second time Jesus mentioned it, it was around the issue of hunger, the issue of provision. Now the apostle, after the ascension, because God will always build on the truth that he has taught you. What is the issue? Colossians chapter 2 verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of what? Food and drink. Isn't the Holy Spirit amazing? When he's about to address the Sabbath again, in an elevated discourse, he goes back to the issue of what? Food and drink. The first time, hunger. Matthew chapter 12, hunger. Colossians chapter 2, food and drink. And Paul is saying, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. Or with regard to what? He names three things. A festival. This word is not a random word. This, this word festival is in direct reference to the seven feasts. And he's saying, let no one pass judgment on you on the seven feasts. Or a new moon. A new moon was for times and seasons. For observances in Israel. It was on the new moon that the east gate was opened. It was always opened on the Sabbath on a new moon. Which was a prophetic declaration. The Holy Spirit indicating by the scriptures through the law, of course, the times and seasons in the fullness of time, the prince would come. So don't let anybody pass judgment. On new moons. Or a, a Sabbath. And he touches the thing. But in the context of what? Let no one pass judgment on you. 
with regard to food and drink. Verse 17, he says, concerning the festivals, concerning the new moon, concerning the Sabbath, he says, these are a shadow of things to come. But the substance belongs. That's an ownership word. It belongs to Christ. That's why Jesus in Matthew 12 would say, I am, rather he said, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So these things, let nobody, actually it says, let no one disqualify you. And that's what he says in verse 18. Let no one disqualify you on what? Insisting on asceticism. What is asceticism? It is the severity to the body. And that severity, you know, people that do extreme things with their body, so that they may be spiritual. All that does is that it opens the soul of a man. And the soul is a uh, extremely powerful organ. The soul came to be. It's, that's a different um, topic for a different day. So he says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about what? Visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. So the mind, I need to say this, the mind plays a big role when it comes to visions and dreams. And that is why Hebrews chapter 12, the scriptures... The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul says we are to renew the spirit of our mind. He says the mind of Christ in another place which is yours. So the mind of Christ is meant to be ours. So we can ask for the mind of Christ by faith. But the spirit of my mind must become, must be the spirit of Christ. And from that spirit of Christ, renewing our mind, we are delivered from this condition. Which condition? The condition of the sensuous mind. And what does the sensuous mind give? It gives visions. It gives angelic encounters. <laughs> it gives supernatural experiences. But the problem is with source. It is not the spirit of Christ. So there's no way it will bring the headship of Christ in that vision. So people will begin to do asceticism. Verse 19. Not holding fast to the head. Meaning lordship. From whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. He continued in verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits. Some people say principles. It's not principles. There are elemental spirits of the earth. The spirits. <laughs> uh, why? As if you were still alive in the world. Do you submit to what? Regulations. That word regulations had everything to do with the law. The law as it pertains to the Sabbath. The law as it pertains to the festivals. The law as it pertains to the new moons. The law as it pertained to everything. What is he saying? He's saying these doctrines are from elemental spirits. But we are to move on, Hebrews chapter 6, from the elementary principles of this world, or even our faith, into maturity. But we want to go back to elementary principles. Verse 22, rather 23, we can skip 22. 23 Closing, he says, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. These things, these observances, 
these regulations, these days that we observe. It is in another argument that Paul will say, one man esteems one day as holy. Another man esteems each every day alike. And he says, do not let no one disqualify you. It's not about a day. It is about headship. Verse 19, Colossians chapter 2. The Sabbath is not about a day. It is about headship. It's about Matthew 12. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And he, that Lord of the Sabbath, becomes Lord of our lives. And it wasn't to do with any physical work. It is to do with work, as we shall see here shortly. So now, the first mention was about hunger in Exodus 16. The first mention by Jesus Christ was in Matthew 12 in the context of daily provision, hunger. In Colossians chapter 2, the first words out of, out, of the, out of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit under the hand of Paul was, do not let anybody pass judgment on you concerning food and drink in the context of when he's addressing the Sabbath. Then he says this in 1 Corinthians 10. Again, we're saying God builds on the truth that he has given to you. Verse 9. So he begins to give us a warning. 1 Corinthians 10 is a warning type of a chapter in the scriptures. He says, uh, we can even say from verse 1 here. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. And all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. And all of them ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. But let's jump to verse 9, 1 Corinthians 10. What does it say? It says, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom we, that is, on whom the end of the ages has come. Now, that verse 9, he's saying we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. What is he talking about? He's talking about Numbers chapter 21. If you read Numbers 21, he says that the people spoke against God and against Moses, asking essentially the same question that they did in Exodus 16, which was, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For what? There is no food, there is no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Talking about the manna that God was raining for them every morning for six days. They called it worthless. We loathe it. Loathe is to completely find uh, unpleasant. It's to hate the thing. So what did God do? Numbers 21. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many of Israel died. So that many people of Israel died. So when Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9, is saying, We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. He's referring to this Numbers 21. Where's Christ? Where do you see Christ there? It's this issue, apostle. It is this issue of grumbling 
Against what? God's daily provision for you. It is not enough. It is this issue of loathing the small, meager, daily provision of God in your life, in my life. I find it insufficient. It is loathing what God is doing presently in your life because it is insignificant in your eyes. I loathe what God is doing in my life right now. We may not necessarily say it that way, but we sure do mean it that way. And when we ask for more, we're not asking for more because of the God and the will of God that wants more to be done. We're asking for more because we need more. What we have is insufficient. You see, this issue of the daily provision. They told God we hate it. And God's response, fiery serpents. Then what else did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 10? He says, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Who were destroyed by the destroyer? That's Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, Moses has sent the spies. They have went and spied out the land. They've come back. Ten out of twelve have given a bad report. Oh, there are giants in the land. Oh, these people are too tall. But Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, gave a good report. He said, these giants, they shall be bread for us. He said, they said, we are well able to take the land. They said to the people, let us go up at once. And it is Numbers chapter 14 that God, even with the intercession of Moses... God declares a judgment against Israel. It is in Numbers chapter 14 that God tells that entire generation that he had brought out of Egypt. He tells them, you will not enter the land of Canaan. And it is from there that God routes them back through the wilderness, kills them off by causing them walk round and round and round and round. Yet how are they walking round? The cloud was still leading them. But leading them where? To God's will? No. Leading them to be killed. And to die off in the wilderness. But I want to present the destroyer. Who is this destroyer? So in Numbers chapter 14. The man who brought up a bad report of the land. In verse 37 of Numbers 14. They died by plague before the Lord. That's the destroyer. The angel that destroys is an angel that strikes with a plague. Apostle, you remember when David, the Bible says he was provoked by the devil to number the people. You remember? Mm -hmm. And the judgment of God, so God sends Nathan the prophet, right? Right? Margaret, he sends Nathan the prophet, isn't it? Nathan the prophet offers how many options to David? Three. He says either this or this or this. He says either three years of famine because of what you did. Or either you run from your enemies for three months. Or three days under the hand of the Lord in discipline. And of course, David, we know the story, chooses to fall in the hands of God because God is a God of mercy. But what happened? The people from the coastlines of Israel. Let me not call them coastlines. <laughs> let me say from the borders of Israel, right? From the outer cities, people began to die by a plague. Like a COVID-19 only worse. And the angel started from the outside of Israel and was coming Toward Jerusalem and people were dying and people were dying until he got to Jerusalem. And he, as he was about to judge Jerusalem, God, the seer, he was a prophet. He was a prophet guy that used to hang with David. So God, the seer, and David, the king are going down and David's eyes are opened. 
David's eyes are open and he sees an angel in the sky. And he pleads with God to spare the city. And when David does that, God commands the angel. He tells him, do not destroy the city. That's the destroyer. He's the angel that God sends to strike with plagues. So what is Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? He's saying they died by a plague. But why did they die? Verse 36 gives us the reason why. Numbers 14. It says, and the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land. They brought a bad report. That bad report caused the people to grumble. Those men, verse 37, died by plague before the Lord. That is what uh, Paul is talking about. Let us not put Christ to the test. So here is Jesus saying, there are good things ahead of you. Bam of Gilead in the national ministry. There's Canaan. But you're like, well, is it ever going to happen? There's good news for you, Margaret. There's good news for you, kids. Good news. But we find it hard to believe. Matter of fact, the daily provision, the hunger issue, the insufficiency issue, we begin to grumble. We begin to absolutely find unacceptable the struggle. Forgetting what God told Moses, the reason I made them hunger, Shetela. The reason I made them hunger is that I may test them. Praise God. And so we catch up with Moses. Oh, in Exodus chapter 8. I will need to double check that reference. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we're closing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yes, it's not Exodus. It's Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy chapter 8. So now Moses has written the first book, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And now he's recapping what God did. And so it brings us now to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Listen to what he says. Verse 1. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Verse 2, he says this. He says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. That he might do what? Humble you. And do what? Testing you to know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. Verse 3, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You remember Jesus quoting that verse? When he told them, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In which context, verse 3, in the context that God humbled them and let them do what? Hunger and did what? Fed them with manna. Exodus 16, all over again. 
It is in that context of your hunger now, your insufficiency now, the issue with your daily provision now, the, the reason why things are thick and things are thin. It is to humble you. It is to test you and I. It is to test us, apostle, if we will wholly follow the Lord. And that in these conditions of insufficiency, in these conditions of testing, in these conditions of being humbled, in these conditions that are very uncertain, because before we grumble, God is not sending us a prophet to say there shall be provision. Moses did not come out in Exodus 15 and say, I prophesy to you, God is going to provide for you. No, he didn't. And the people were having hunger. But it was a test, you see. Unfortunately, they grumbled. And God used the Sabbath to test them. And he gave them manna, which then they said they hated. And he sent fiery serpents. And by the way, how did he cure the issue of the fiery serpent? He told Moses, make a fiery serpent of bronze. Lift it up. And whoever looks at it will be healed. Jesus Christ used that reference when he said of himself, when the son of man is lifted up, he shall call all men to himself. He actually said of himself, as Moses Lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must also the Son of Man be lifted up. God presents us Christ. In Matthew chapter 12, what was the answer to David's hunger? Jesus said, have you not read about David? How he did what? He ate the bread of the presence. It is the presence of God in our insufficiency. That presence, Teleba Shata, that presence of God, He must be to us our sufficiency. He must be to you your sufficiency. Amen. But let's continue with our brother, senior brother Moses here. Verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. He tells them, after he tells them the reason why this condition is happening to you. Listen to me. If you're not in some form of compromise and God is having to deal with your sin as he has dealt with mine. And God is allowing these conditions to surround you. Believe me, there's no curse strong enough to hold you down. If Christ be in you. The Lord is allowing for a moment these harsh conditions to humble you, to test you, to know your heart. Oh, glory to God. I feel the presence of God. So Moses says to them, verse 4, Deuteronomy 8, your clothing did not wear out on you. And your foot did not swell these 40 years. I remember being young and walking about five miles for the first time. And oh my goodness, my feet swelled up. But then once we did that, you know, two, three, four, five times, we got used to walking those kind of distances. But verse five is what I want. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. It was a matter of discipline. You see how things are? It is a matter of discipline. It's not that you are without discipline. And even in that, God will deal with it. Right? But it is that more than that you're without discipline, it is that God is working discipline in you by allowing these conditions. You remember in Hebrews where it says that the captain of our salvation, the author of our salvation, 
himself had to be tested through suffering and may be made perfect. It's the same scenario. So now Moses continues and he says this in verse 15. I'm jumping so for the sake of time. He tells them of the God who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness. And what was there in the wilderness? Look at this. Verse 15, Deuteronomy 8. He says, with its number one, fiery serpents. Why did the serpents come? Because the people told God they loathed the manna he was providing. They complained about the daily provision they were having. And what, and what did he tell them? Scorpions. Moses said there were scorpions. You read throughout the scriptures. From the prophet Isaiah to the prophet Jeremiah to Ezekiel. I should correct myself. God never called them prophet Isaiah. He always said Isaiah the prophet. In Jeremiah the prophet. In Ezekiel the prophet. God said, I will discipline you with scorpions. So scorpions here, Deuteronomy 8, represented the fact that God was, yes, disciplining his children. Of course he was. But more than just disciplining his children, he was working discipline in them. By the test of the wilderness of sin. So verse 15. He's telling them to remember the Lord their God who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents, with its scorpions, with its thirsty ground where there was no water. But look at the last statement of verse 16. Apostle, listen to this. The God who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, number one, that he might test you, number two, for what reason? To do you good in the end. Amen. It is for that end. Why all this discipline? Why all this? Paul in Corinthians. He speaks about the hard time they had in Asia when they went there. He says we were besides ourselves. Meaning they felt like they were losing their mind. They went through so much persecution. He says we despaired of life itself. But he says God had mercy on us. Because why? Then he said this. He said that we may not learn to trust in ourselves. But in God. Why is God doing these things to you? Why is God allowing a daily provision that is barely enough. For years and years and years. He's allowed this condition that is not as a result of blatant sin. And if it's as a result of blatant sin, God will deal with you on it. He will. But he's allowing this, Margaret. He's allowing this to do you good in the end. Deuteronomy 8.16. And now I close with this. So in Luke chapter 10. Jesus, having previously called the twelve, gave them power, gave them authority to do what? Cast out demons and to heal all manner of disease, right? In Luke chapter 10, because God always builds on the truth that he reveals to you, he calls not twelve this time, he calls seventy of them. And he sends them in 35 groups because he put them together in groups of two. He says this to them in verse 4, in the interest of time. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. There's much to say about not greeting people on the road because you remember when Elisha meant to raise the son of the Shunammite woman from the dead, he gave his staff to Gehazi and told Gehazi, don't greet nobody. 
and you go lay my staff on the boy, and he shall resurrect from the dead. There's much to be said about the anointing, but that's not what I want to focus on. Luke 10, chapter 4. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. These 70 now were to go cast out devils, heal the sick, and do all these things. Oh, so much to say, you know. But let's go to verse 17 so we can close. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. He says, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Verse 19, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you and I tell you by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus this authority on serpents is through the test of daily provisions thou shalt not despise the day of your humble beginnings and it is through that path that you get authority over serpents. Because you do not grumble. So the serpents have no power over you. You do not complain. So the scorpions have no power over you. That's why Jesus is saying this. You see, he had already given them power and authority. To cast out demons and to heal all manner of disease. That is from verse 1 of Luke chapter 10. They go, they heal the sick, they cast out demons. Can you say they had power? Yes, they did have power. Then what is this other authority that he's talking about in verse 19? They've come because they have authority, you see. They are telling Jesus, we've cast out demons, apostle. They are telling Jesus, I mean, they're healed. People are healed everywhere. And Jesus is saying, behold, I give you authority over all the power. Wait, what? What kind of authorities are there? How many are there? But the one in Luke 10, 19 is not the same one he gave them before. This one, he says, you shall tread upon serpents and scorpions. So I wanted to talk to us today about the authority over serpents and the authority over scorpions and the authority over all the power of the enemy. What is the path of that authority? The path to obtain that authority is the path of being humbled. It is the path of being tested. It is the path of being not complainers, not grumblers, people that do not loathe the daily provision. It is this. It is rest. The Sabbath was about rest. This is what rest are we talking about? We're talking about resting in God's certainties. That he that has promised shall fulfill. That he that caused a conception shall bring to delivery that God is faithful, that he does have a plan, that he hasn't taken you and I all the way from Egypt only 45 days later to be clueless about what we're going to eat in the wilderness. No. So we do not need to grumble so that he can give us manna. Maybe he has a better idea. But because we grumbled, now he has to give us manner to test us. Did you know that the, hey, they were to collect an omer per family. You go read it, Exodus 16, last verse. It has this detail that the Holy Spirit inserts in there and he tells us, and an omer is a tenth of an ephah. Why would he put that in there? Because he's referencing the tithe. And in another place, Moses writes by the Holy Spirit, he writes, and God gave them the law of the tithe to test their hearts, to see if they will obey the Lord. 
Authority over serpents is rest. Authority over scorpions is rest. When? When you're hungry, rest. When there is insufficiency, rest. When there are humble beginnings, rest. Rest in the Lord your God. Rest in him. That he who came with a mighty hand 45 days ago for the people of Israel, bringing them out, will be faithful even in the wilderness of sin. Authority over serpents. Authority over scorpions. It is unlike the authority to cast out devils. It is unlike and different from the authority to heal all manner of disease. disease. This is Luke 10, 19. Authority over serpents, over scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. The route there is suffering. Did you not know that Peter said, he that has suffered has ceased from sin? What do you mean? That there's a kind of suffering that the fruit thereof is righteousness. There's a kind of a seeming delay. And the fruit thereof is authority over serpents. There's a kind of a seeming insufficiency. This almost conditions that are so harsh and you seem to not come out of them. And they're not born of the devil. These conditions are born of God, allowed of the Lord. And just as the captain of our souls had to be made perfect through suffering, he has invited us into what the scriptures would call the fellowship of his sufferings. Do you think that Jesus grumbled? When he told that Israelite, when he said, oh Lord, I want to follow you Oh, I want to be, Jesus said, the son of man has not even a place to lay his head. He says, even foxes have holes. Birds have nests. The son of man doesn't have a place to call his own. Do you still want to follow me? The fellowship of his sufferings. You remember when Job, our senior brother, was invited by the Father, into the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ? What did Eliphaz, the Temanite, and his other two friends think of Job? You have seen Job. Surely there must be a curse. Surely something needs to be broken. Surely there's an altar speaking. No. It is the Lord curating the tests. To humble you, Deuteronomy 8, that he may do you good in the end. Amen. Let us stand up. Hallelujah. So, Father, today we ask, Lord, for eyes to see. We ask for ears to hear. We ask, Lord, by your spirit that our hearts may understand. We know, Lord, this necessitates a working of, spirit, of your spirit. We can't engineer it. We can desire it. We can ask you for it. We can be willing. But God, we understand you have to do this work. And Holy Spirit, you're faithful to do this work. And we ask you to do it. We ask that Christ be formed in us. We ask that Christ be established in us. And we ask you to reveal to us these, these things that we're talking about. This authority over scorpions and serpents. And over all the power of the enemy in a way that it doesn't hurt us. Because Lord in your love you have worked your discipline in us. So we invite you to be unto us. That which that you are meant to be, our deliverer. You be unto us life and be unto us light. You be all unto us that you are. Do your work all over the world. To those that are watching and will watch. 
most especially, Lord, to us right here, right now. Do us good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.